Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jill Burrows, and it's my very great pleasure this afternoon to welcome you all to this Raising Peace session. How do we integrate head, heart and hands into our practice of peace in the everyday life of family, workplace and community? I'd like to start by acknowledging that all over Australia, we're meeting on Aboriginal land, which was never ceded. And I pay respect to all elders, past, present and emerging. I especially welcome any First Nations people who may be with us today. I am on Darug land, Darug land, in Northern Sydney. And I thank them for their care of this beautiful country over many thousands of years. The Racing Peace Festival is being held in the lead up to the United Nations International Day of Peace on the 21st of September. And it's organised by an amazing alliance of more than 30 organisations that work together to share ideas, knowledge and inspiration for a peaceful world. To learn more about the network, our website is www.raisingpeace.org.au. Most of the sessions of this event are recorded and will be placed on our website in the next few weeks. You can also find there recordings of our previous Raising, Raising Peace online events. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Michael Wood. Michael is an Anglican priest, coach and facilitator. He's a member of Pace Bene Australia and a founding member of the Peace and Nonviolence Education Australasia Network. And I'll put these links into the chat. Michael has led an online contemplative prayer community. He was an Anglican chaplain to the university for 15 years and currently works as a community chaplain with an Anglican church in Melbourne. Michael will talk this afternoon about his recent book, Practicing Peace, Theology, Contemplation and Action, which will be followed by a Q&A. Although Michael has written primarily from a Christian perspective with churches and Christian leaders in mind, the conversation is pertinent to anyone thinking about how to take an integrated approach to peacemaking and nonviolent leadership in everyday life. Sorely needed at the moment. Okay, a bit of housekeeping. We ask you to please mute yourselves while listening to avoid extraneous noise. The session will go for around about an hour and will be managed by Brooke, who is our tech support raising peace today. Thank you, Brooke. <laughs> Without you, it wouldn't be happening. <laughs> uh, you can place questions for Michael in the chat. If you have resources to share, you can also place them in the chat. We encourage you not to engage in a debate in the chat. And if any of you are able to change your names, if you're um, on an iPhone or, or you've got Fred's computer or something, um, we invite you to do that. So without more ado, over to you, Michael. Right. Um, thanks very much, uh, Joe and uh, Brooke, for tech support. And thank you for coming for this little uh, conversation. Um, well, <laughs> partly me talking and partly conversation. Um, I'm grateful that you've shown up and I hope it's somewhat useful. Uh, I want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation of, as the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm sitting here in Melbourne. Um, 
just to provide, as Jill said, I'm going to be uh, talking about this um, largely with a theological, Christian theological frame in mind. And I'm trusting that um, if that's not your frame, that you'll be able to do your own translations. I found when I was uh, a chaplain at the University of WA, I had a lot of contact with um, people of other faiths, particularly Muslims and Buddhists. And I often found that <clears throat> some of the most useful conversations I had for deepening my own Christian understanding of things was to engage in conversations with them. Um, it often gave me new insights into my own tradition. So uh, I hope if Christianity is not your tradition that you would find um, what I'm saying still some way of maybe provoking your own thinking and I'd be very interested to hear that at the end too. Um, so the structure of today is I'm going to talk for roughly 30 minutes. I'm not going to engage in questions in the chat during that time. In fact, I'm going to try not to look at them because <laughs> I'll, I'll get uh, distracted. Um, depending on how we're going for time, I was thinking I might put people into chat rooms uh, for a bit of engagement with each other and then come back at the end for any final questions. And if there's um, anyone who wants to hang around longer, apparently we can have this room open for another half an hour after 12.30 Eastern time. Uh, uh, so I'm happy to hang around and talk longer if anyone wants to. Um, one of the principles of a process I use a lot called open space technology is that who, um, one, whoever comes are the right people and the law of two feet applies. So the law of two feet means if you're not interested, engaged, learning or contributing to the learning of others uh, in a session, feel free to use the law of two feet and put yourself somewhere more useful. Uh, in IT land, this is called the law of one click. It basically just means hitting the red button on the bottom right hand corner and saying, see you later, I'd rather go and get a cup of tea than listen to this. Um, so use the law of one click if you need to, you'll be happier and I will not be offended in the least. Um, I'll, the slides that I'll be using today will be available in a PDF if anyone wants to email me afterwards, um, feel free. So that's a bit of background just to context setting. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about this book, Practicing Peace, which was published in February this year. And um, I'm going to be using slides to guide my own thinking and talking, but you really don't need to be reading them or anything. Uh, feel free if you want, but it's really just to provoke me. Um, and some people learn better by reading than listening. So I'll just put these up. Um, so do you have a PowerPoint slide? Give me a wave if you do. Can you see that? Yeah, great. Okay. So Practicing Peace, Theology, Contemplation and Action, that's the name of the book. That's what I've been reflecting on for about 10 or 15 years now, or maybe longer, maybe 25 years. Um, and I want to start with the who or the what provoked the disease or dis-ease. Uh, so I, I can only tell this story from my own experience. So I thought I'd just read one page from my book, from the preface to begin, uh, rather than try to wing it. And that will just give a little bit of context to how this came to be written. Um, I talked about uh, leading a small church community um, in about 20 years ago in my mid thirties, around four years into my ministry as an Anglican priest, my confidence started to unravel and I came close to slipping into a clinical depression. I'd been working in a series of financially struggling parishes with small congregations. I knew something about the Bible, theology and church history from my formation as a priest. I discovered, however, that this was not enough to navigate the complex relationships and other daily demands of a small local church. Being young and enthusiastic, I tried to heroically lead from the front, coming up with lots of ideas and with which I tried to engage other people. I assumed it was the job of the priest to get things going to happen, get things happening and to be the one in charge. And this idea of being in charge was supported by the language used on bishops licenses issued to me, such as rector, which means ruler or priest in charge. My endlessly patient congregations bore with me with humility and encouragement while the parish bills grew and the congregational numbers stagnated. I was working too many hours and was frequently tired and irritable at home. 
When I look back on this experience, I perceive, perceive what can be described only as signs of violence. This included violence to myself and subtle forms of violence towards other people, either in the way I thought negatively about some people, which I describe as internal violence, or tried to control people, which I describe as external violence. This is particularly ironic because I had always been keenly interested in Jesus' commission for his followers to be peacemakers or ministers of reconciliation. I don't think I'm alone in this predicament of noticing a big gap between what I believed and the way I sometimes lived. It has been my observation that the use and abuse of power is one of the unspoken shadow aspects of church life. By shadow, I mean those things that are largely invisible or denied within ourselves. Because much of my life is now spent working in non-church contexts, I know that the problem of violence, sometimes physical and also, but also psychological, social and spiritual, is endemic in families, communities, congregations, organisations, cultures and societies. So that uh, sounds very depressing, doesn't it? But it was a, my sense that I'm kind of being imbued in, or in a milieu, uh, swimming in a milieu of, um, of uh, this kind of violence. So starting question to reflect on, what dis-ease do, do we bring to this reflection? And who or what is provoking this disease for you? So just a, maybe a starting question to reflect on it or to reverse a common aphorism, if we are not part of the problem, we can't be part of the solution. So that's just to be a bit provocative and stir us up a bit, I hope. In what way are we part of the problem so that we might become part of the solution? Right, so this uh, festival of which we're a part is called Raising Peace. So what do we mean by peace? And what does it mean to raise peace? Everyone has a starting point. As I said, mine's a Christian theological one. And I've always been very intrigued by the statement that Jesus makes when he says, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. It's got me thinking about what the difference was between the kind of peace that Jesus leaves us and the kind of peace which the world tries to create. What is Jesus talking about here? From a theological perspective, I'm going to start with the answer and then work back to the question. From a theological perspective, peace is a given. It is the end of all things. It is the telos. Uh, that's the word for the trajectory to which everything is ending. In the end, there will be peace. So how does this end, this promise or this hope, if you like, help us to diagnose or understand the dis-ease of violence in which we're often living? An insight, huge insight, hugely influential and helpful insight for me personally into understanding the disease of violence from the perspective of its healing comes from the work of an American, French-American literary theorist by the name of René Girard. So I want to start by talking a bit about the way René Girard diagnosed the problem of violence from his studies of literature which he initially did as an atheist, as a French um, philosopher atheist, he eventually became a Catholic um, through his study of the scriptures, in interestingly. But um, he was initially asking the question just from the perspective of a literary analyst. So working through, and I apologise if this is well known to you, um, hopefully it will be a bit of a refresher, or if it's not, uh, I want to spend a bit of time on this, because what I'm not going to do today is kind of give the 10 point plan about how to live, integrate theology, contemplation and action in daily life. So if that's what you come for, for the answer, for the 10, 10 point plan, you'd be very disappointed. It's time to use the law of one click now. What I actually wanna do is actually paint a bigger picture, which is how do we conceptualize violence and start to understand what different kind of peace might look like. 
So it's more of a conceptual frame from which we can draw our own conclusions and maybe uh, map out our own paths. So it may reinforce some of what we're already doing or it might uh, lead us in some new directions with some new insights. I hope it does anyway. So the basic, first basic principle that Rene Girard came up, came up with from his study of literature is that human beings are fundamentally imitative people, that we uh, learn uh, what we learn through imitation. So we learn language, for example, from listening to our parents. Uh, we learn morals and values largely from the families and cultures in which we, we grow up. And we observe behaviours from observing those close to us. Well, that's a bit of a no-brainer. We all get that. Gerard, what Gerard really developed was the idea that we not only imitate each other's um, behaviour and values and language, but we imitate each other's desire. And he, the word that he used for the imitation of desire was mimetic. So we learn what to desire by copying the desire of others. We learn what we desire by copying the desire of others. So we think we know what we desire and we think it's our original desire. Like I'm, I'm desiring a sip of water is a clearly just a biological fact. But when it comes to the kind of car that I want to drive, I'm hugely influenced by the desire of others. It's the way advertising works. It's a very nice BMW park just down on the street out there. So every time I think of it, I say, oh, wouldn't it be nice to drive that BMW? So um, a classic example of this, for example, would be two toddlers. Anyone who's ever had kids or nephews or nieces or observed children, you would have noticed this. Two toddlers are sitting in a room. There's a toy, one toy sitting between them. The toy is of no interest to either toddler until one toddler picks up the toy. And as soon as that happens, mm, we've potentially got a battle on our hands. Suddenly that toy becomes an object of intense fascination to the other toddler. So think about toddlers and toys, but then think about ourselves as growing up toddlers. That's the kind of path that I want to take us down. So escalating contagious anxiety is the next step. Pretty much the battle is on for the toy, the object of shared desire, and we actually lose touch with what we're fighting about in the first instance. And all we're doing is imitating each other's anxiety. So, um, and pretty much soon we've got a kind of a storm brewing if you like. So here's just a little film clip I, I've put to illustrate this. So I'm not sure if I tip the share sound box, so I better just check that before I go any further. I did. This uh, was a little promotional uh, video that was made. As, uh, any Marvel fans here? I know it's the younger generation. It's my daughter's generation. Might not be ours. Give us a wave if you ever watched a Marvel film. Yeah, no, it's definitely a different generation. So Captain America and uh, Iron Man uh, engaging in an act of civil war in one of these Mar Marvel films. So the two actors that play Captain um, America and uh, Iron Man uh, in this little clip. It's a little illustration of mimetic rivalry. So what I'd invite you to do is to look for the object of shared desire and how that uh, ramps up anxiety and just see whether this rings any bells for you. Oops, here we go. Morning. Evans? Danny. Hmm, try again. Is that the last donut with red, white, and blue sprinkles? What did I tell you would happen? If you ate the last donut with red, white, and blue sprinkles. A little foggy on it, but I think it was something like raining down hellfire. That's right. And here I am without an umbrella. I feel a storm brewing. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, if we don't play that back, I'm canceling the press tour. Okay. So has anybody ever had the last donut in the fridge and somebody in the family has moved in and taken what you wanted for morning tea, right? If you have, you just experienced mimetic rivalry and mimetic desire. And according to Rene Girard, the foundation of all um, violence in the end, um, wars are fought over scarce resources, right? 
So what applies in the battlefield applies to the family, it applies to friendship networks, it applies to community organisation, it applies to churches big time. Often what we're fighting about is not material possessions, it might be a shared desire for power, uh, uh, a, a competitive desire to be right, competitive desire to be impressive. So a million things, a million types of desires can be the things that we fight over. Now, this is a huge problem for communities because it can lead to a dynamic of all against all, where everybody is fighting for scarce resources. And this is, what Gerard said, this is a huge um, problem in, in potentially the destruction of community. So for example, if we took the two children, the two toddlers and the red fire truck, and we ramped it up into um, uh, adult behaviour. Here's an example from Black Friday 2019, somewhere in the US. Um, although we might have seen this actually in the New York Year's Day sales at Myers in Melbourne or Sydney, wherever we come from, where people queue out the front as soon as the doors open, everyone piles in to kind of get access to those scarce resources. So Human, uh, Gerard proposed that human communities need a mechanism in order to manage this potentially uh, destructive dynamic of all against all, which will uh, destroy the community from within. And this is where uh, the thesis that he came up with in his book, The Scapegoat, was that the way communities stabilise themselves from the all against all dynamic is to shift their anxiety from each other onto a shared object of... Um, focus, which he called the scapegoat. So somebody is chosen at random, usually it's somebody with a disability who looks a bit different, a different culture, different shaped eyes or different language or whatever it is. Somehow a person who's a little bit different from the crowd, the crowd will spontaneously, and they don't even know why they're doing this, will unconsciously focus on, on the scapegoat as the person who they then blame as being responsible for our fighting. Why are we fighting? Oh, it's um, it's let's say somebody I let's say somebody I know here. Oh, Dale, Dale won't mind me saying this. Okay, so anybody who puts slides of trees in the background of their Zoom is clearly a social problem, right? It's a completely irrational statement, right? But somehow, because this person is a little bit different, we're going to focus on that per all our attention on that person. And that person becomes the person we exclude. And now peace has been restored to the community because we've kicked out the disruptive, uh, uh, the dis disruptive element. So by getting rid of Dale out of the picture, now our society is restored to peace because we've found somebody to blame. Um, it wasn't really about us fighting over scarce resources. All this um, hyperactivity and anxiety that happened was really Dale's fault. And we can probably find some really good reasons for why that was the case. So just a little um, humorous, I think, I hope, um, example played out on a film about how this occurs, but potentially can have very um, violent ramifications, comes up in this little film clip called Gun Town. So I'm just giving a little warning here. If you hate guns, you might uh, not like this um, video very much. I, uh, don't worry, nobody is going to get, um, there's not going to be blood and guts or anything. It's set up as a humorous clip, but it's designed to, well, I don't know if the filmmakers actually had Gerard in mind when they made it, but they certainly nailed Gerard's theory when they made this little film. So let's just have a look. And look for as well the justifying um, story that lies behind and excuses the uh, violent activity in this. <sighs> First day of open carry. I just have to do a little explanation. So the guy just said, first day of open carry. Now, if you're not an American, you might not know this, but in certain states of the US, um, there are periods of time, it might be a week or a month, where people can carry guns openly. So it's called open carry, meaning I can openly carry weapons during this period of time. So when he says, first day of open carry, he's pumped. That's the background. Okay. And I'm pumped. It's good guys with guns are gonna keep this country safe and free. Might even buy this CD to celebrate. Yeah, I'll take a good... Coco Chino, uh, extra brownies, some whipped cream. Excuse me. Nutmeg. Did you know there was a line back here? Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I thought you were still shopping. You want to try that again, son? 
As a matter of fact, I do. Put the gun down, no one gets hurt. Whoa, 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 I'm the good guy. In this scenario, I'm the brave vigilante protecting the rule of law. And I'm the proud patriot standing his ground. I'm 99% sure that I'm the good guy. I am 99.9% .9 sure that I'm currently the good guy right here in this situation. Okay, just put your hands up. Don't you point that thing at me. Don't you know a good guy when you see one? I am the good guy. No, I'm definitely the good guy. I'm the noble worker protecting everyone in this establishment. Mm-mm. Susie, tell mommy your daddy's about to be a hero. Drop your weapons! <laughs> On the armed victim slash concerned citizen slash neighborhood watch extraordinaire, saving the day. I don't know who you're saving yourself from, son. I'm the good guy. Bull honky, I'm the good guy. I'm a good guy, too. All right. I'm taking charge of this situation on the floor now. Drop her, I shoot. Shoot who? The bad guys. Who are the bad guys? You all seem pretty terrible. I am the Good Samaritan here to lend a helping hand. Freeze! Well, I need to know which one of y'all are good guys. So good guys, raise your hand! <laughs> I see what's going on here. You! You come with me. I, I'm, I'm the only one that ain't got a gun! Are you resisting arrest? Y'all folks have a good day. Thank you, sir. Came out of nowhere. Didn't even see him over there. Whew. That about got real hairy. Closer than two cockroaches on a bacon bit. Oh, good lord. Just... <laughs> oh, oh, Finger trap. You good? Yeah. yeah. All right? Okay. This guy got hit. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, kid. What? That's the price of freedom. Price of freedom. Uh, speaking of freedom, I am famished. <laughs> you fucking shot me. <laughs> Yo, man. Speak for him more butt. Tell you what. Okay, so that pretty much kind of outlines the dynamic we're talking about, or Gerard was talking about. And it might be that kind of rang a few bells for. Um, some of the things that are happening in our world for the moment, but maybe you've seen that played out in some way in your community, your church, or um, organisation. Uh, how people will align themselves around a shared um, sense of identity, which is about excluding somebody else. Um, so that peace is temporarily re-established through the choice of a random scapegoat uh, in the US, which is where that film was made. It's often um, constellates around race. And um, I'm sure there would be indigenous people in our country which would say that's the case here as well. So does the scapegoating mechanism work to achieve lasting peace? This is the question. If this is the kind of culture that we're in, uh, immersed in, one that re-establishes peace by finding someone else to exclude, blame, scapegoat. Get a little bit of insight into this from a poem by Coventry Patmore called A London Fate. This is a section of it um, where he uh, tells the, writes this poem in response to seeing a public hanging. Right. The rope flew tight and then the roar burst forth afresh less loud, but more confused and affrightened than before. A few harsh tongues forever led the common din, the chaos of noises. The ear could not catch what they said. As when the realm of the damned rejoices at winning a soul to its will, that clatter and clangor of hateful voices sickened and stunned the air until the dangling corpse hung straight and still the show complete, the pleasure past. The solid masses loosened fast. A thief slunk off with ample spoil to ply elsewhere his daily toil. A baby strung its doll to a stick. A mother praised the pretty trick. Two children caught and hanged a cat. Two friends walked on in lively chat. And two who had disputed places went forth to fight with murderous faces.
So the act of public violence settles the crowd for a little while, but ultimately doesn't deal with the underlying issue of mimetic rivalry and violence breaks out again in the community. But now we can feel good about ourselves because at least we've dealt with some corporate crime here and hung someone. So we don't have to confront our own violence. So the way human culture, according to Girard, the way human culture uh, makes peace or re-establishes peace is through what we might call blaming, naming and shaming, silencing, cancelling, excluding, killing, any way we can to get rid of the disruptive influence and stabilise our community. And more importantly, to justify this with self-reinforcing stories about why we did the right thing so we can feel good and holy about ourselves. And Jesus himself becomes a victim of this kind of violence. Jesus predicts in one of the Gospels, the time is coming when anyone who kills you, talking to his disciples, will think that they're offering a service to God. Very often violence is framed in religious terms. This person absolutely deserved to die. How do we know? Because our moral religious system says so. And Gerard's uh, had a particular use for the word myth. Uh, a myth was a justifying story which would justify the violence. Terribly sobering thing for those of us who uh, are in any kind of faith system. But we don't have to be people of faith. We could just use any kind of self-justifying law or morality that we happen to choose. Um, Jesus himself becomes the victim of this dynamic when the high priest says to the people that are overseeing Jesus' trial, you do not realise that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. It is good for our community that we kill this guy. Otherwise, the Romans are going to come down on us. So that's background. Now, uh, when Gerard, as a scholar of literature, explored the Hebrew and the Jewish scriptures, he expected to find, find this same kind of dynamic there. He expected to find the same mythologies as in culture generally, which was religiously justified violence, and he did find it. But what he also discovered uh, was a strong countervailing movement, which was the perspective of the innocent victim. Uh, and he sees this popping up in various parts of the Bible right through the Old Testament, um, the, the killing of Abel and um, Joseph being thrown down a well, you know, by his brothers, the cry of the um, uh, victim in the Psalms, the suffering servant passages in Isaiah, and ultimately culminating in his own death and coming back as the forgiving victim with the statement from the cross, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. And guess what? They didn't. They did not know what they were doing. Okay? Because it, scapegoating is always an unconscious mechanism and it's always 100% self-justified through appeal to our own sense of righteousness. And that's what makes it such a powerful device for communities because it is beyond critique, because it is self-reinforcing from within our own value system. So Gerard saw it within the scriptures and he was primarily interested in the Jew Jewish and Christian scriptures. He didn't do a lot of work on Eastern scriptures like from India or from the Islamic world, although Gerardian scholars now are doing a lot of that work. Um, so he was that was his frame of reference. So he starts to see this kind of unpicking of the scapegoating mechanism from within the scripture of the tradition itself. Um, and there's a, what he sees is a kind of a trajectory through the history of the Jewish and Christian people from what he described as the vengeful victim right back in Genesis 4, where Lamech says, if seven lives are taken to pay for killing Cain, 77 will be taken if anyone kills me. Which makes complete sense of then the teaching that Jesus says when someone comes along to Jesus and says, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And Jesus says, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. So it's a direct reversal uh, of this kind of mechanism, if you like, of blame, kill to forgiveness. The bottom line here being that from a spiritual perspective, violence is not resolved by more morality or law, 
but is only resolved by inner transformation. In inner transformation, so violence and peace of the type Jesus talks about, and undoubtedly other religious traditions talk about, is not resolved by law, but is uh, resolved by inner transformation. It's a spiritual issue, and it can only be dealt with spiritually and or re relation relationally. Uh, so, and the great example of this, for example, is St. Paul, who was a, a vol as Saul was a violent, zealous man who persecuted the church. He was a murderous thug. And he did this all in the name of his own religious tradition. He called himself the Pharisee of Pharisees, so somebody who knew the law better than anybody, the man of extreme uprightness, the good Bible-believing Christian, if you like, good Bible-believing Jew. He realised after he was encountered by the risen Christ, that he was actually a man of violence in the name of religion. But the only way he could get out of that was for this kind of inbreaking to happen from outside his cultural system. And that's why to read the uh, scriptures in a non-violent way, which is what I talked about in my book, and, and I'm picking this up from many other people, it's not original, is we actually start, we actually, to understand the scriptures in this way, we need to read the scriptures not as a, as a quest, like somehow I understand violence, now what can I do about it? But to read the scripture as a memoir, which is, bam, there's been some kind of intervention in my life where I've suddenly been able to see the system I'm in uh, in a different kind of way. Right? Seeing the system from a perspective of life and grace and love and spirit, and now, in light of that, I start to read my scriptures in a different way. And I'll pick this distinction up from a, a biblical scholar at um, Duke University where he talks about reading the scripture as memoir rather than quest. It's a very powerful distinction which we could spend hours talking about, but we don't have time. The problem with a hero's quest is that we think we can see our own problem, but we can't because we are quite literally out of our minds. Jesus says there's a log in your own eye. So don't try to take the speck out of somebody else's eye until you take the log out of your own eye, which is blinding you. So practices of peace in the Christian tradition are all practices which, practices which aim to reorient desire from desire which is entrapped in the scapegoating mentality of the crowd to a desire which is placed at the feet of one who is utterly nonviolent. So reading the scriptures through the lens of the cross, the Eucharist as a symbol of the broken body and the one who forgives us unconditionally, the Trinitarian theology that emerges, that emerges from that becomes the theological basis for dialogue, contemplative prayer um, and dialogic process like, processes like talking circles and open space technology, nonviolent communication, restorative practices, forgiveness, retreating, all these kind of things, all these processes in the end are designed to decenter the ego and put it at the service of one who is not our rival. It's to take us out of the system of mimetic entrapment and put us into the zone of freedom. All right? So being a Christian, it's not about being a better Bible-believing person. Actually, no, I won't say it. It's the way we read the Bible, okay? It's not about morality. It's not about becoming more good, if you like, in inverted commas, it's actually about having our lens that's cleaned. It's about an inner transformation which helps us to step out of the violent system in order to see it for, from what it is. And that is always an inbreaking to us. It's usually not something we achieve. It's usually something that kind of smacks us down on the Damascus Road like it did for St Paul. So I'm two minutes over. <sighs> Time for conversation. A um, couple of questions to reflect on. Uh, I'm going to put us into breakout rooms for about seven minutes. Um, groups of two or three. Any responses to this? A um, couple of specific questions, if you want. In what places, people, situations, events do you experience peace? To what extent do you experience peace as a gift? And are there ways in which you experience yourself being kind of mimetically entrapped or drawn into the violent culture or where, you know, you've been kind of, you have an experience of being in your own life of being kind of sucked into a system which is inherently 
disintegrative of relationships. Right. So work with those questions if you like, and then we'll come back together for the last um, 10 minutes or so. Um, stop share. Uh, breakout rooms. Uh, how many people? We've got 22 people, let's say six breakout rooms. Um, uh, create. Options. We lost two people on that. <laughs> In <laughs> saying we're going into breakout rooms. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, eight minutes. Let's, let's make it seven. Okay. See you later. I'll see you soon. It looks like there are people in the different rooms, so that's okay.
Where are you today, Brooke? I am sitting at home in Sydney. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Whereabouts are you, Michael? I'm in Melbourne. Oh, okay. How's the weather with you today? Yeah, I learned a new word the other day. It's called grizzly. Ah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, it's a very lovely day in Sydney, so I'm excited to go and sit in the sun at some oh, point. Great. Welcome back. So, um, how's the time going? We've got about five minutes, but again, you know, hang around. Oh, 10 minutes. Hang around longer afterwards if you want to. So, um, yeah, just throw it open to questions, thoughts, reflections. Feel free to use the chat box. Um, to put in our thoughts or questions. Suspicions, curiosities, um, outright outrage, disagreement. Um, can I speak? Hi, Therese. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, our, in our little group, uh, we had some responses. Uh, one was uh, from Tanya, who was surrounding herself with affirmations about love and peace and and getting above uh, what were the everyday um, difficulties, I guess. Um, and... Daya spoke about uh, bringing family together for a party and the enjoyment of that sort of, you know, connectedness. And um, I spoke about an event that I was part of this morning, which was to uh, look at the progress of um, a reserve, a local reserve along a creek, uh, which had been... Uh, totally devastated by bushfire and now local groups have been working to reinstate it as a, a valued place uh, in our community and to me all of these things that are healing and leading their their thing and 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 affirming they're the things that Bring peace. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. So the first thing I heard there was the um, kind of surrounding ourselves with, Im with images of peace or words, for example. But a connection I made with that was in the meditation tradition of the mantra, which is designed to focus the attention, um, which is a way of taking ourselves out of the mimetic milieu the vortex if you like and training the mind to focus on the non-violent aspiration okay and with working in nature you know i mean obviously aboriginal people have got so much to teach us here but how the land um not only something we do but is also a revelation for us it speaks to us and helps us to see i used to go out to a desert retreat center in western australia and you know, it's only when we withdraw from the city that we can see the city with new clarity. Um, and Jesus sometimes does that with people he's healing. There's a, one of his stories of the, taking a blind man out of his village, uh, out of the group, out of the kind of mimetic entrapment, if you like, of who this man is in relation to his neighbour, um, for the healing to occur so they can re-engage with the community in a different kind of way. Thank you. Uh, coming together with a, a non-confrontational, or we're, with a single purpose, like working in the bush. Uh, in our group, um, one man spoke about dancing, as uh, and I spoke about singing as as things that uh, that bring us to a peaceful sort of place. Thank you. Something I find very helpful is listening to stories um, from other people about how they have dealt with 
day-to-day situations of violence whether they're kind of interpersonal or amongst a group but hearing hearing the way they found to to bring peace uh, both to themselves and to the the group group they're with i, I find that stories like that are, are inspirational because uh, they come to can come to mind if you find yourself in a similar situation Mm, thanks, Jill. And if I could add to that, um, I think what I also shared is one sentence or a couple of sentences you put in terms of conclusion <clears throat> that stays with me where violence is not resolved by more morality or law, but by inner transformation. And I think, um, you know, it's a spiritual experience. Um, I think that is the essence of everything um, I'm hearing in terms of story sharing and, and, you know, experiences people have. Underneath all that is how do you actually have that change? You're lucky if some higher power makes it happen for you, which I think is what Paul's story is. There was a timing when intervention was necessary you know, to change the course of history. Um, but for all of us, uh, we're not so, we are, we are, but if you have, you have to be able to read the signals and make the change. So thank you very much for stimulating thought. Mm -hmm. Thanks there. Yeah, I mean, obviously Paul and, for some people, it's very dramatic. Um, it may be that what has brought us here today is that kind of um, speaking, the very fact that we're asking the question, I would say, from the position that I'm standing is a form of grace. I've put a little note in the chat about a book that um, Susan Connolly published earlier this year. Am I clear? Yeah, a little bit of scraping on the microphone, but I can hear you. Yep. Yeah, I put a note in the chat about a book by Susan Connolly um, using Girard's um, philosophy to look at Australia's relationship with East Timor. And so, you know, it has been applied already to international conflict. What I love today was hearing it applied to our own little local conflicts and particularly conflicts within religious groups and bringing, I, I presume Girard was very open in his application of it to biblical stories, but I'd never heard that. And I very much appreciate that. But there's a note in the chat if you want to look up that book, it's, it's quite, um, quite worrying and good yeah yeah thank you for the reference yeah in my experience the in churches the and it's actually and i think in any workplace um is the rivalry is doesn't this is, is not constellating so much around material things as it is as it might be between nations for example like who owns the oil in the timor straits or whatever who gets access to it but how we um, the 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 rivalry is coming around control, power, and control, and being right. Um, and I've noticed in my own experience that is hugely difficult to um, unless we recognise that we're trapped in it. I, re I had to leave a, an employment situation once after a couple of years because I realised I was immersed in a deeply rivalrous relationship with a. The manager, my my boss, if you like, and I couldn't see any way of, despite all my best efforts, uh, I couldn't see any way of um, dealing with that except to leave. Um, it's not always what you have to do. Sometimes the conversation could deal with it, but I needed to, first thing I need to do is realise that one of the reasons I was so stressed is that I was actually in a rivalrous relationship with this person for power and control which was actually pretty humiliating, but also really useful. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, we're, on, we're at time, Jill, so I'm wondering if formally you might like to wind this up, but if anyone wants to hang around and chat for a bit longer, I'm happy to do that. Um, oh, are you muted, Jill? Yes, ever a, pit, a trap for us Zoomers. Um, yeah, well, thanks so much, Michael. Um, pity it's so short. The time has gone by remarkably quickly. Um, yeah, so it's such a big question. I mean, we could have this conversation all afternoon, but thanks very much for your insights. I have downloaded your book on my Kindle and um, I love the, the preface because I think that the, the personal journey of individuals it's a bit like i was saying about story being helpful i think it helps to give insights um i'd also like to thank all the participants um we didn't have all that much time to hear your wisdom but thank you so much for coming and for the interest you show and for what you will have gleaned from today you may not notice it immediately but i'm sure it will come come to you over time. Um, I'd like to thank Brooke for her um, keeping us going on the keeping us organizing all the zoom. Uh, I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting this off the ground. Um, just to let you know that there is another um, interactive workshop this afternoon, which will be conducted mainly in breakout rooms called new narratives for piece um, that goes from 2.30 till 5 and you're welcome to go to that um, and thanks for again for participating there are more events throughout the week leading up to um, uh, International Day of Peace I'll just pop those links I mentioned earlier in the chat So, sorry, it takes me a while to do this. As they say, talk amongst yourselves <laughs> while I do it. Thanks very much for your hosting, Jill, and to Michael for yeah. lots and lots to think about there. Yeah, yeah. Thank indeed. You, Michael. Yes. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All the best. Wilbert's thrown a great question in the chat. How can you discover or reveal mimetic desire and scapegoat mechanism when it's not intentional or conscious? I feel dancing, by the way, is a genuine inner desire. Mm. Great question. <laughs> I think partly actually it's what spiritual traditions are designed to do is to help us to, uh, and the grace that works through them is to help us to become more aware of our entrapment in the system. Um, But unfortunately, what they tend, they often do is just try to reinforce morality, and that can make the problem worse. Don't know if that's any good <laughs> as um, uh, Wilbert for such a great question. I don't know what you think. If you want to. Um, I, I don't know if an issue myself <laughs> just by asking the question, but I think it's. Uh... Yeah, it takes a lot of time to discover uh, of, uh, discover such mechanisms and get to, get to, uh, get aware of it and try to change it and in a way that it's not violent in some way of that it doesn't lead to this, this easy. <laughs> yeah. 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 How do we address the as an organisational uh, psychologist friend of mine? Um, he, to, he, he has this recommendation for constantly coming back to the issue rather than the person, because we tend to get in a rivalrous relationship with the person. If we, keep mm. refo if we keep refocusing it on the issue at hand, that can help us with the entrapment. Uh, I find that helpful. Uh, Ben Zion's put in here about uh, Jesus for the Disinherited by Howard Thurman, who I think was a spiritual director to Martin Luther King. I haven't read a lot of his stuff, but what I have is 
Beautiful. So thanks for the recommendation. Thank you for uh, thank you uh, thank you for uh, also putting us in the breakout rooms and to reflect on the, on the questions. No worries. Helpful. I put the 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 links to the raising peace website in case anybody wants to go to. Uh, I'll have a look at the other events that are being uh, uh, held and also the peace and nonviolence education.org. So should it have a .au after it, Michael? No, it's just .org. .org, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anybody involved in education um, at whatever level may be interested in um, being involved with that group. Yeah, the... Anything else emerging for anyone? No, it was also interesting for me because uh, I'm raised up Catholic, uh, uh, Christian tradition, uh, but I'm now, I'm now Muslim, and that, uh, it's also I think it's also a religion, a religion of peace. Mm -hmm. It is like uh, I have to trust. I also have to translate also the, the stories. Some of the stories are the same, of course. Of course, uh, like the stories in the Old Testament, are also uh, stories of the of the Quran. But it is uh, it's interesting to get back to my roots. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, um, I'm just trying to remember where I saw it. Uh, but if you email me, well, but. Um, I'll try to track it down. An uh, Islamic scholar has just written a book on uh, reading the Quran and Islam through a Gerardian lens. Mm, um, so if you can email me, I'll try to remember. I only saw it last week somewhere. I'll try to track it down. Okay, okay. I'll email you. Do you want to put your email in the chat, Michael? Yeah. It sounds like an interesting, interesting book. Yeah. Because uh, th there are various conversations around um, Islamic violence, should we say, um, you know, based on being stirred up hugely around the, the um, Twin Towers and the, all, all the narrative around that. And in fact, I mean, you could view some of the the narrative around that as, as scapegoating and certainly revenge um, and forgiveness, I think, is um, an element of the Christian approach to overcoming violence. Yeah, and, pro and huge, really, I think, in most traditions, um, I mean, forgiveness is absolutely the primary front and centre thing in Christi Christianity, without doubt. Uh, but there's a huge amount in the um, Islamic tradition about the importance of forgiveness, particularly amongst the scholarly tradition, yeah. which I'm not really well read in at all. No, no. But we don't, we don't hear very much about it. We just, the narrative that came out after the Twin Towers was hugely against the people mm. who follow Islam and that was really bad but at least there was um, I think an urge to get to know people, um, Muslim people better, that there was quite a backlash against that narrative which has been I think helpful mm. and in, into interfaith um, activities have have grown and i think that's really important well one of one of the traditions of 
that's grown out of Islam, but is actually more ancient, is the Sufi tradition. Mm. Uh, that's all about peace yeah. and love. Yeah, absolutely. Also, we do dances of universal peace in a group I'm part of, and that's all about singing and dancing for peace. And it's, um, yeah, it's it's very much at the heart. And I, some years ago, I was teaching adult migrant English, and we had some Indonesian students, and we got a scholar to come in from Indonesia to say, well, what's, in, you know, the Muslim tradition in Indonesia about? And the first word was peace. Because Islam is about salam, it's just about mm. peace, and it's just a real opener, because um, for for me too, because I'm from a Jewish background, and there's a lot of not so good things often said about the Islamic tradition in the the community I come from, but I've come to see it very differently, particularly through the Sufi lens. And thank you for the session; it was very inspiring. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Sufi. So is a mystical tradition really isn't yeah. it it's um yeah. the um I, I just think we can in the end if we're going to have any kind of peace in a tradition it's got to find its contemplative roots absolutely um, i yeah. mean Tom, uh, yeah. yeah i mean um america i can't say the united states because they're the most disunited states <laughs> foreign policy runs on revenge yeah, mm. and, and that is, that's no recipe for peace. That's what was so disastrous about the, the gut reaction to the, the Twin Towers. It wasn't a considered response. It was a, mm. a, a fight back response mm. immediately. The, the, the were, um, there was a group um, that sort of said not in our name and um, can't remember now what they were called, but they were people against that military response. I had, I had a friend living in New York who was part of the cleanup, and she said the question they weren't allowed to ask was, why do they hate us so much? Yeah. You can see the rivalry, yeah, even in this conversation. Like the, um, so you're right, the response is a mimetic one. So you hit us, we will hit you. It's, it it, it, it um, bypasses the rash. It bypasses thinking and goes straight into emotional mirroring. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and then the question for us as people who want to practice peace, I presume, is to recognise when that happens in ourselves. Mm. Yeah. How that happens. So almost on a daily basis for me anyway, you know, mm. I, somebody honks you on the road what's the immediate response <laughs> yeah. take a deep breath <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, been the gift for me today that you've made us see that it's our own personal response that, that that's imp terribly important you know you can't fight for any good cause <laughs> you've got to live for a good cause Oh, I like that. You live for a good cause, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And that's where I find the stories so so helpful when I hear of people, particularly on a personal, interpersonal um, basis, of people who dealt with a violent situation by taking another route, another path, um, which wouldn't have occurred to me. And I think, oh, wow. What a brilliant way to to respond. And thank you for your mention of Susan Connolly's Connolly's book. Mm -hmm. um, Susan is has has done an amazing um, work on on Gerard. I, I've um, she ran a course at the Aquinas Academy in Sydney on Gerard, mm -hmm. which was terrific. Um, um, yeah, she's really good to apply it to the Australian political story. Sometimes it's difficult also to give a non-violent uh, response. Uh, I've, I've been working in former Yugoslavia uh, as peace activist and working with refugees uh, on, on both sides. 
and once I met a youngster uh, who, who wants to go in the army. And I said, yeah, uh, this may be not a solution, but uh, I was thinking uh, to, I was thinking to say that maybe it's not a solution, but I think he wouldn't he wouldn't accept it because he was determined determined to go into the army because he lost family members. Uh, so I kept kept silent and I could have kept, I could have asked questions, but it was like. Uh, this is sometimes it's difficult to give a non-violent response. Uh, I, best thing what I could, could have done is ask questions. Uh, would, it, would it be the solution? Uh, but it is, uh, I was, I was, I'm a pacifist and I'm, uh, I'm not, uh, in any case, I'm not, uh, I'm not in, in favor of violence uh, in whatever sense, but, uh, um, you can't uh, you can't always uh, rationally explain it to people because they, they are in 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 a mood and emotions but but uh, but it's overwhelming sometimes so it's, uh, um, my my message can be clear for myself but it can't be clear for other people. Uh, mm. Mm. And for me, it's important to reflect on these issues, uh, also on a personal level, uh, to see where I stand, and where I, where I personal stand in, in personal conflicts, but also in, in conflicts in the world. Like, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the hard politics movement um, that grew out of Joanne Macy and uh, Fran Peavy developed a whole thing about strategic questioning, which I always found very useful. Um, you know, just sort of where you're asking questions to find out what's what's going on behind the person's thinking or feeling or rather than trying to attack them. And mm -hmm. I've often, I mean, I've heard that done, like like your storytelling, Jill, it, it's something that, that can really make a difference. You know, when I've heard someone ask one of those questions what do you think about this or why do you think that and it can really change the whole conversation mm. so it's a, that's another strategic questioning it's called it's really mm. yeah. yeah great um first first step in nonviolent communication yeah uh, curious strategic <laughs> right. listening it's so hard to do isn't it well Some when you're very, when you're very emotional it's not that easy but <laughs> Sometimes it, uh, I've heard people do it so really so well that it really changes things. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. 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 I found that um, book title. Sorry, uh, I just thought I'd find it while I could. So it's called the Islamic Theology of Nonviolence. I'm just putting it in there. Ah, okay. Islamic. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm, I'd be very interested in that. You can put it in the chat. Yeah, I'm just sticking it in. Excellent. Thank you. I'm just going to have to go very shortly because I've part of this session this afternoon. Okay. Ah, thank you. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave you, Michael. Okay, thanks, Jill. <laughs> Thank, thanks again, and thanks for all you lovely people who've stayed on. It's it, I love to hear everybody's contributions. And may I just say in, in leaving, the experience of working with the Raising Peace group is one of living peace, should I say. It's um, a very cooperative and creative group where everybody is giving <laughs> to use the communist phrase everybody is giving what they have for the common good um it's it, it yeah it's really inspirational so thanks for your, thanks for being uh, making it happen Joe. appreciate it yeah thank you very much
All right. I think it's like we might be done, are we? Shall we yeah. head off? Thank you. All right. Bless you. See ya.